everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm the last startup pitch for today. My name is Neil Mothuka. I'm the CEO and co-founder of One3 Biotech. And for those of you who are here this morning, you heard a little bit about from how you take a drug through the last stages of the process and get FDA approval. What I'd like to talk to you about today is the early stage of things, what I like to call drug discovery. How do you even figure out which chemicals might make a good drug for a given disease? Now, if you dive into this, you'll realize that our current drug discovery system is incredibly broken. 97% of all drug discovery projects started in pharma fail. Each failure can cost up to $500 million and 10 years of R&D time. And it's reasons like that that 70% of all known diseases have zero treatments available. Now, these are some big numbers, but it's ignoring perhaps the most important part of the drug recovery equation, the human cost. Those 70% are real patients who are going without treatment. When I was in college, my grandfather passed away from a rare form of liver cancer while there were no treatments available. And perhaps the saddest thing is that my story is not all that unique. Every day, thousands of patients are suffering because we haven't figured out what a better way to discover new molecules is. Now, as an AI person and a data person, I thought, let's turn to the data. And as you know, data is exploding nowadays, especially biological data, genomics data that pharma companies are collecting, but even the data that scientists are collecting. Robotics had made it possible to generate 1,000 data points in the time it would have taken to generate one 20 years ago. But the problem is, is that existing approaches aren't using this existing, all this data. What they're doing is they're picking their favorite data type, let's say genetics, and building a whole system around that. And while that has power, it's losing so much information and therefore losing a ton of accuracy and a ton of potential drugs. We built 1.3 to solve exactly this problem. At 1.3, over the last five years, we've built an AI platform that can integrate over 25 different data types to decode biology and use this information to help identify new drugs in weeks not years. Our current platform integrates four times as much data as any existing computational platform out there, even the ones in the big pharma companies. We've benchmarked accuracies at 90% at identifying new drugs. This is 25% higher than what's out there currently. And to date, we've been to, built about 12 different algorithms attacking various points in the drug development process. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. We've published our results in some of the leading journals like Nature and Cell, and to date, we have some fantastic academic and industry partners who've been working with us specifically because of the utility of our platform. This includes universities like Weill Cornell and Stanford, but we've also secured partnerships with Boeing Ingelheim, AstraZeneca, and just earlier today with AbbVie to use our platform and help improve their drug development pipeline. Let's talk exactly about how it works. We start off with our backend proprietary database, which has data on millions of compounds, thousands of targets, thousands of diseases, and over 20 data types. From there, for each disease, we build a disease-specific network, let's say liver cancer, for instance. This network tells us which genes we think are most important and where drugs should act on. From that, we pinpoint the genes that we think are key to diving that disease and find drugs from our database that are predicted to act specifically on those genes. We then use our platform to filter out the drugs that are predicted to be unsafe in patients. Then, taking these top drug candidates, our platform can go even further and tell us how we should change these drugs to make them work a little bit better. Maybe increase their efficacy or lower side effects or increase the possibility of it passing through the blood-brain barrier. And finally, what we can do with these optimized drug candidates is find the patients out of everyone that are most likely to respond. One little known secret about drug development is most drugs only work for about 20 to 30% of patients. But if you can find that 20 to 30%, you can make sure you get the right drugs to the patients who need them. Now, you don't have to take, listen to me about this. We've been working at this for a long time, and we know it works. To date, we've used our platform to identify over 15 new drugs that we've validated either in cells, animals, or in the clinic. We worked with a company called Oncosudix, where either drug we predicted for them was validated and is currently in phase two clinical trials. They told us that a problem they've been working on for five years, we were able to help solve in the span of about three months. Additionally, with Wild Cornell and a few other universities, we have new drugs in phase one and preclinical development right now. Going forward, we see two main ways we can use this platform. 
One, and perhaps the most exciting one, is use it to identify new drugs, figure out which ones work, and then sell or license those drugs to pharmaceutical companies to run through clinical trials and commercializations. But also, an interesting avenue is there's so many drugs already out there in development that pharma companies still have questions on. And we can use our platform to help answer those questions, give them more information about their drugs, and using that information, they can optimize their own internal development pipelines. We're the right team for this. I got my PhD in computational biology from Cornell's med school, um, where I developed the back end for this technology and was named to Forbes 30 under 30 list on the basis of this work. My co-founder is Director of Precision Medicine at Wild Cornell, one of the foremost leaders in AI-driven drug development. And our VP of ComBio is the, the rare person with the intersection of bio and machine learning. We have some fantastic advisors. Mike and Bruce have worked on over 40 different early stage drug discovery projects and now have run or created their own pharma firms. Dr. Wong was actually on the team that helped develop IBM Watson, the first real machine learning healthcare application. Thank you guys so much. We're one three biotech, currently raising our seed rounds. If anyone's interested, talk to me and happy to take any questions. I have a question about the market size. Perfect, I love market size questions. <laughs> Generally, what is it and how? Okay, so, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, okay. So I'd say there's two main markets. One is for that inside to the service, the outsourced R&D markets. Last year, pharma companies spent $12 billion paying smaller companies like us to do early stage R&D for them. Additionally, 70% of all drugs currently in big pharma came from pharma buying them or licensing them from smaller companies like us. Uh, and last year, that was $30 billion just in upfront fees. We we'll wanna focus on the oncology segment, which is about 40% of that. The average drug gets licensed for about five to $10 million upfront for the additional $100 million in revenues with a one to 5% continuing royalty. So I have a question about value prop. Yeah. I um, worked with two pharma companies, or actually small biotech companies that both had kind of flagship products fail either in phase two or phase three pivotal trials. Yeah. Is the value prop that you're offering that we just look deeper and broader at the data and kind of remove some of the bias? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. I think that hits at part of the issue. One big reason that these drugs are failing in phase two and three pivotal trials is because early on, they didn't understand the biology. So that's what we do. We say from the very beginning, before you do your first human clinical trial, we will use our system to give you as much biological information as possible. What that means is that means you could learn your drug is just not a good drug and you don't spend the money doing phase two trials. Or you could learn, maybe if I modify it this way, I can make it better for phase two, or maybe it's better for a completely different disease. We've worked with three pharma companies to do exactly that. We've taken their main candidate, told them that bio and said, actually, you guys are going for liver cancer, we think you're much more suited for brain cancer, and they've gone and pursued that. You, you mentioned that 70% of diseases have no treatment. Um, is, is the kind of drug discovery problem really the problem there, or is, that, or is that solved by a different part of the value chain? It's a fantastic question. I'd say it's a little bit of both, right? I think a lot of diseases, specifically rare diseases, it doesn't make economical sense for big pharma companies to go after them, but it's perfect for a company like ourselves. For us, we can run a drug discovery project on cancer just as well as we can drug a drug discovery project on a rare digenic disease, assuming we can get the data, which we've been successful in doing so far. And then, once that early stage discovery is made, we can then partner with the pharma companies to bring it to clinical trials where it makes more economical sense for them to pursue. So we've seen more of this rare disease drug discovery emerge um, in the past two or three years, but I think that's really an avenue where computational work is gonna have a huge dramatic shift in thinking. As far as the data, wh where do you obtain the data? Is it proprietary, or where, wh what are your data sources? Fantastic question. Um, we obtain it from three sources. First, we mine public databases, so we spent about nine months building a backend that can mine basically any time a new data starts come out, we add it in. We're generating our own data, so we have a partnership with Cornell and a few other institutes to build in generator that they've generated themselves. And also, through many of our pharma partnerships, we get access to their proprietary data to build into our platform. So a few different avenues. I think in the long term, we may think about in-house generating data, but for right now, we're really confident in those three. Uh, do you have any filters in place to maintain 
uh, the ability to keep data contamination from coming in. If you're getting contaminated data, then it's going to lead to a, a, a bad conclusion. Yeah, so it's a, can I ask a question? It's something uh, my CTO would love to tell you about. Um, yeah, so we have a bunch of filters in place to make sure that the data we're come getting in is actually good data. Um, so what we do is if we see a data set that says this target is toxic, we compare it to a few different data sets we have on our end. We have our own backend filters to score every data based on reliability, and that's built into our model. So for instance, if we get a really messy data set, and there's tons out there, what we can do is we can model in that messiness and make sure we go in. Um, one other really powerful part is because we have 12 different algorithms, if even if one data type is messy, one prediction gets messy, by filtering it over multiple different drug discovery steps, we can filter out the bad predictions and really only focus on, on the good drugs. All right, another round of applause. Thank you. Good stuff. <laughs>